We'll be looking at Transputer Occam message protocols today. As usual, we'll be using the Try It Online emulator. And here's the main page. And here is the um, Occam Pi page. Okay, um, to kind of put everything into context, sometimes people may think, well, why am I even talking about Occam? Uh, it's a computer language that died 25 years ago. Um, certainly it must be irrelevant by now. Well, not really. Um, let's kind of take a look at what's happened to uh, processor speeds uh, since the Occam days. Processor speeds have probably, you know, when I was designing back in the 80s and 90s hardware, uh, 50 megahertz was a pretty good board speed. If you could get a whole circuit board running at 50 megahertz, you were doing quite well. But then speeds moved on chip speeds, so maybe 500 megahertz was pretty good. And it's even gone up another order of magnitude to 5 gigahertz. But uh, that pretty much stalled around the mid-2000s, maybe 2005. You're not really seeing a lot of chips going faster than 5 gigahertz. Well, how come there hasn't been a big uh, speed increase? Uh, you know, Moore's Law has kept going up. The number of transistors per area has continued to go since uh, grow since uh, 2005. And I think uh, we're actually hitting some fundamental limits. Uh, take a look at the speed of light. It's about a nanosecond a foot. So let's say you had a 6 gigahertz processor. That means you could go about 2 inches in one clock cycle. Well, that's pretty small. And then the actual speed of an electrical signal isn't the speed of light. It's about half the speed of light. So you could really only go about 1 inch per clock cycle at 6 gigahertz. Well, this is getting to be kind of a serious problem, but we have all these transistors and we don't know what to do with them. Well, the obvious thing to do is to have multiple CPUs. As a matter of fact, the computer I'm working on right now is a Intel six core 12 thread computer, but it's the very rare program that uses more than one core. If you look at the little CPU uh, messaging thing, it's about maybe 15% um, of the, uh, that one core is about 15% of the processing time, and you'll rarely see any single program taking more than 15% of the total CPU usage. Uh, the one exception to that is, of course, Windows Movie Maker, now obsolete, which I have actually saying paying 100% of CPU usage. But video is very, very easy to paralyze because you're doing all these streams, and it's very easy to dice up and put back together. So that was one application where uh, you uh, do want to have concurrent processes. Again, you have the single instruction, multiple data, or multiple instruction, multiple data. Transputers being more like multiple instruction, multiple data. So I think that with all this CPU power, the transputer Occam model gets better and better and is now completely relevant. We basically hit the point where for the last 15 years, we really haven't been able to do anything with all those uh, in increased transistor counts. And so if we could run concurrent programming, we could get more use out of our uh, program. So um, transputers weren't obsolete. They were, I think, actually ahead of their time, and their time is now, uh, they now call it uh, concurrent sequential programming, CSP, or multitasking, everybody knows that word now, um, and various other things. So I think Occam is actually more relevant than ever. And if you did want to make a uh, parallel real-time Python program, uh, you would be well uh, behooved to try running a few programs in Occam so you could understand the ins and outs of uh, how you really want to do it. So I think Occam is actually completely relevant these days and on to... Uh, message protocols. So let's look at some code. Um, here we have a simple protocol. And so we have the procedure M71 channel byte, channel one, channel two out. So it's this channel byte is the simple protocol. It's just a byte. Conveniently, it's the same as out. So anything we can do on channel one or channel two, we can do on out. So let's take a look at how this byte protocol works. Pretty easy. Uh, we'll put it in A and variable A. Channel 1 will output it. Channel 2 will get it in the next procedure. It'll Then channel 2 will then output A. Channel 2 in the other first procedure will get A, and then we'll output it. So let's go ahead and run this and see what happens. And sure enough, we get A. 
So the important thing of the simple protocol is it's just a byte definition, and that's pretty easy. The next protocol we're looking at is a simple counted array protocol. And again, the channel protocol is an integer colon colon byte vector, and that's for channel one and channel two, and we have the standard byte out on the other channel. Um, so what this allows you to do is to send a variable length byte message, and you can specify the number of bytes with this integer, and then you can ha have whatever uh, you want in your byte vector. So let's uh, take a look at our code here. Uh, message, again, is a byte vector from 0, 4, 7, I mean, starting at uh, message 0, going for 7 spaces, and we'll put in hello carriage return. So we say k equals 7, then channel 1, bang, 7, colon, colon, message from 0 for 7. Then channel 1 down here gets a message. It doesn't know what the length or the values are in advance, so it'll get the 7 and say, oh, I need to get 7 bytes. And then we can uh, send it back by saying channel 2, bang, m, which was the value we just got from 0 for m, from 0 for n. And then channel 2 gets it, and here we just have very simple uh, output statements, i equals 0 for k, output a of i. And A of I was our uh, message uh, buffer. Okay, pretty simple. Uh, again, when we come down here for our uh, process that ties the two processes together, we have to declare channel int colon colon byte, which is the simple counted array protocol. So this is extremely valuable. You can send variable space, variable size messages without knowing in advance what they're going to be, and you can receive variable size messages without knowing in advance what you be, you just determine it as you get it. And there we have our hello. Okay, the next protocol we'll be looking at for messages is the sequential protocol. And here we'll say protocol vehicle is a 5-byte byte, byte vector, 10-byte byte vector, and an integer. And so we'll have channel, again, that's protocol vehicle. We'll have channel of type vehicle, channel 1, channel 2, and then channel byte out. So for our 5-byte uh, portion of the channel, we're going to call that make. The 10 byte portion of our channel we'll call model, and uh, the number will be, we'll call license number. We'll kind of forget the fact that we don't have alphanumerics in there and just say it's a numerical license number. So this is a message again is fixed. It's five bytes fixed, 10 bytes fixed, and an integer. There's nothing variable here. Uh, yet this is what, when you send a message down, down this channel of type vehicle, that's the format they'll be expecting. Okay, so let's take a look at our code. So we define a uh, five byte uh, vector, 10 byte vector, an integer. And we'll say make equals five spaces just to initialize it. Model equals 10 spaces just to initialize it. Then we'll say make equals Honda. Uh, again, if make was Kia, then we'd wanna have empty spaces, not just random garbage. And then model zero for six equals Accord. Again, that's only going to take six of our 10 spaces. License number 234567. So here we get to our first uh, output. Channel 1, bang, make, model, license number. And we'll go on to our next process. Channel 1 gets, make, model, license number. That all makes sense. And then in this process, channel 2 outputs, make, model, license number. And here, back to our first process, channel 2 gets make model license number. So then we'll output the make, we'll output the model, and then we'll output the license number. Let's see if it works. And yes, we got a Honda Accord with a license number of 234567. There's something called a variant uh, protocol, which is very important, and we'll do that in the next video. Okay, that's it. Bye.